Almanar International Tolerance Convention. And before I call upon Sheikh Mufti Ismail Menk for his talk, I request his intro video to be played. Dr. Mufti Ismail Menk is a leading global Islamic scholar born and raised in Zimbabwe. He is the Grand Mufti and head of the Fatwa Department, the Council of Islamic Scholars of Zimbabwe. He studied Sharia from the prestigious Islamic University of Medina, Saudi Arabia. He also holds a doctorate in social guidance from Aldersgate University. He is an international scholar, well known for his universal message that appeals to a wide range of audiences from around the world. He has millions of followers across his social media platforms. Mufti Menk's personable style and honorable approach has made him one of the most sought-after scholars in our time. He has endeared himself to people with his much-loved lecture series, a Mufti Menk trademark. He travels the world spreading a simple but profound message. Do good, help others, while preparing for the hereafter. Mufti Menk's work has gained worldwide recognition and he has been named one of the top 500 most influential Muslims in the world since 2010. He is active in the international arena and is a strong proponent of peace, justice, and speaking up against all forms of terrorism. Please join me to welcome Sheikh Mufti Ismail Menk for his talk on the topic Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, beacon of tolerance. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most gracious, the most merciful. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, all praise is indeed due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lord of the worlds, the creator, the nourisher, the cherisher, the sustainer, the provider, the protector, the curer, the one in whose hands lies control of entire existence. We praise him. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all those who were sent in order to remove mankind from darkness to light, to guide them, to show the light that the Almighty had placed for us. We send blessings upon the companions of all those messengers and at the same time, we ask the Almighty to bless every one of us. Amen. My brothers and sisters, we are speaking of tolerance. And this International Tolerance Convention comes at a very, very important time where there are people who are misunderstood, more so the Muslims and Islam being misunderstood, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, being misunderstood, we being the followers of Muhammad, peace be upon him, find it difficult sometimes to explain to people that what is happening by a small number of people is not actually the teaching of Muhammad, peace be upon him. We have been in existence for perhaps more than 1,400 years as followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, although Islam existed from the very beginning, people ask, what do you mean Islam existed from the beginning, but the followers of Muhammad, peace be upon him, from the time he was sent to mankind as a prophet? Let me spend a moment quickly to explain this. When it comes to matters of belief, from the time of Adam, may peace be upon him, and Hawa or Eve, may peace be upon her. From that time, they always taught to worship one God, the maker. That never changed. So that is Islam, to surrender to the teachings of the maker and whatever he wants from you. That is Islam. So believe in a maker, believe in the last day, the fact that everything one day is going to come to an end, the hereafter, believe in the power of the maker, the names and the qualities of the maker, believe that he is in absolute control. He is, as I said earlier, the nourisher, the cherisher, the sustainer, the provider, the protector, etc. These are all matters of belief. When it comes to matters of belief, nothing changed. Jesus, may peace be upon him, taught the same thing. He also taught that 
the Almighty is one, the Almighty should be worshipped alone, the maker, that one day things will come to an end, there will be a day of resurrection, there will be a day of reckoning, there will be that judgment day where everybody is going to be accountable for whatever they did on earth. All of this was taught even by Moses, may peace be upon him. Even by Abraham, may peace be upon him. And all of those messengers, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us peace. I mean, so on that front, every teaching was identical. It was always the same. That is called Islam. It is called the submission unto the Almighty in terms of belief. We also refer to it as Iman. Iman we have categorized as that which cannot be seen. It's within you. You claim something with your tongue. We can hear the claim. We can see you say it. But whether or not it's in your heart is between you and the Almighty. So that is Iman. This existed from the beginning, but when it comes to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was sent in a specific place and he was sent at a specific time and he was sent to humanity at large. And above that, he was sent as described by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you, O Muhammad, peace be upon him, except as a means of mercy for the worlds. The plural is used because it's not just for the people of his time and it's not just for the Arabs within Quraysh but rather it extended to the world at the time and to the worlds that were to come to those who were to come right up to the end and not only that but to jinn kind as well and the mercy extended to the rest of the creatures of the Almighty so much so that we know of narrations where animals happen to communicate with Muhammad, peace be upon him, just like they communicated before him with the Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam, although it was on a smaller scale with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, a camel came to him complaining about the treatment that the camel was receiving from its owner. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, summoned this owner and re reprimanded him regarding his treatment of this animal. Thereafter, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, Wallahi inni la a'rifu hajaram bi Makkata kana yusallimu alayhi. Wallahi, I know a stone or a little rock in Makkah that used to greet me, subhanallah, used to greet him when he used to pass. And we believe that yes, this happened and it is possible and it definitely did happen. We know about Sulaiman alayhi salam, he communicated with the clouds and the wind. He communicated with the other creatures, the ants, and so on. This was all the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this man, if you ponder for a moment, you will realize that he has been sent as a mercy to all. And this is why the merciless acts that are perpetrated in his name have nothing to do with him. Because he was sent as a mercy. Did the Almighty say, O Messenger, we sent you to be merciless upon people? No. We sent you to be ruthless. We sent you to be a tyrant. Not at all. We sent you as a mercy. So therefore, those who want to emanate the beautiful teachings of Muhammad, peace be upon him, one quality will be very, very apparent within them. They are filled with mercy. They are filled with blessed character and conduct. They love for others what they love for themselves. Yes. While they stand up for justice, they will be from among those who are filled with mercy as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. So don't be confused. When you see people portraying themselves to be religious, but they are merciless, they are actually far from the teachings of Muhammad, peace be upon him. A sign of religiousness is when you get softened. Listen to what the Almighty says about his mercy. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْفَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكْ فَاعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Allah speaks to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, It is only by the mercy of Allah 
which means it is a sign of the mercy of Allah and it is by the power of the mercy of Allah that you, O Messenger, are lenient towards those around you who may have even been harsh towards you. Wow. Those who were harsh towards Muhammad, peace be upon him, he treated them with leniency. He prayed for them. I can rattle so many examples of that, especially in the Meccan period. Subhanallah, early in the day when Muhammad, peace be upon him, knew who he was, definitely the messenger of Allah, the blessed of creation, etc. Never did he let that be a chip on his shoulder to become arrogant in the least. Nor did he allow that to make him ruthless in the least. If anything, it made him filled with mercy, compassion, and goodness. And this is why Allah says, it is because of the mercy of Allah that you, O Muhammad, have become lenient or are lenient on those around you. If you were harsh or hard-hearted, they would have dispersed from around you. That's the translation of the second part of the verse I recited. If you were harsh or hard-hearted, they would have dispersed from around you. Is that not evidence enough for us to show not only tolerance, but to go beyond that to show mercy? To learn from the one who was sent as a mercy, the one who has told us that the most merciful only has mercy on those who show mercy, have mercy upon those on earth, and the one in the skies will have mercy upon you. What powerful words of the same messenger, the messenger who taught us tolerance, he taught us mercy, he taught us kindness, he taught us to reach out even to the enemy. For indeed, there was a stage when a lot of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, were actually the enemies of Islam. But it was because Islam proved itself over time that in the face of your enmity, we will continue our goodness, our mercy, our compassion, and our beautiful teachings will actually penetrate through your heart such that you will be convinced this is the true messenger of peace and this is the religion of peace. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, excuse them, forgive them, and pray for their forgiveness as well. And call them in order to ask their opinions regarding certain matters, although the final decision is with you. Imagine if I were to call a few brothers, brothers or sisters and say, you know what, there is an important decision I need to make. What's your opinion? And I take them into confidence and I listen to what they have to say. Even if I don't follow what they've said, but I've lent them an ear, doesn't it give them importance? Doesn't it give us that relationship of goodness, a relationship that is more intimate, it is closer than it would be had you ignored people? And this is why in your own home, in your workplace, as the circle becomes broader and broader, learn to communicate with people in the most blessed way. Learn to value their opinions. I started off by saying the home. Do you know why? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, the true characteristics of an individual are reflected by how they carry themselves within their own houses. How do you carry yourself within your house that is a true reflection of your characteristic? When those you live with can bear witness, wow, this person is a really great person. You have succeeded. May Allah grant us all success. Succeeded in terms of character, in terms of conduct and goodness and kindness. These are the characteristics the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says about himself. He says, I am the best from amongst you when it comes to my family members. So my brothers and sisters, now I take you back to the beginning of the life of the one who was sent as a mercy, the beacon of tolerance, the beacon of goodness, Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Hashimi al-Qurashi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. Right at the beginning, when he was born, his father had already died. Subhanallah. His father had already died. 
That was a consolation to those who have been born orphans to say it is not a sign of the anger, hatred, or subhanallah, it is not a sign that Allah does not want you. It is not a sign of the anger or hatred of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor is it a sign of the punishment of Allah. Rather, if the most beloved unto Allah was brought onto the earth after his father had passed away, don't you think it actually has great value for those who are orphans? And this is why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who's actually the beacon of mercy and tolerance, says, Ana wa kafilu fil jannah. Myself and the one who takes care of an orphan child shall be resurrected like this. We will be together in paradise, actually. We will be together like these two fingers in paradise. And he showed the first and the second finger put together. Because he was an orphan himself. And if you have that within you to look after a child who's not yours, you're a real man. Subhanallah. You're a real man. Why? You realize the importance of development of these children who are our children as an ummah, as a nation, as humanity. These are human beings just like it is important for us to save a life. It is important for us to build a life as much as we can. Many of us are worried about ourselves and our own children. Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us, yes, you will be concerned about yourselves and your children, but show concern for the children of others as well. And this is when you can actually show who you are. You can live a life of happiness and peace because your concern is not just for your own children. It is for the children of humanity at large. People suffering across the globe should hurt you. It should pain you. You should tell yourself, what have I done and what can I do in order to assist these who are struggling across the globe? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, later on in his life spoke about how we're all like the organs of the same body. If one part of it has been hurt, the entire body suffers restlessness and insomnia. If one organ is complaining of some pain, the entire body is suffering and feels that pain. It suffers with what? With fever, with insomnia, with sickness. So just like that, we should be concerned for one another. It's not just about myself. Unfortunately, the materialistic world around us teaches us about myself, me, and I. That's it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us broaden this. Muhammad, peace be upon him, born in that way, and a few years later, he lost his mother. Subhanallah. He lost his mother. When he lost his mother, he was taken care of by his grandfather. A few years later, he lost his grandfather, one after the other. My brothers and sisters, when you lose your loved ones, it is not a sign of the punishment of Allah. When you lose your parents, it's not a sign that Allah has forsaken you. It is not a sign that Allah has written your failure. That might just be the root of your success as it was on a totally different level, the success of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When you lose something, if you take it in your stride and you actually surrender to the decree of the Almighty, he will open more doors than he has closed. The only thing you have to have the courage to consider that door closed and move on. When you don't move on, you have yourself to blame for being stuck where you are. Whether you've lost a job, whether you've got a health matter, whether you've perhaps got a loan that you cannot pay back, whatever it may be, a marriage that is about to be broken, children that you are struggling with, whatever it may be, remember, build on what the Almighty has given you. That is your door to happiness and goodness. Never give up, persevere, continue. And understand that the mercy of the Almighty is a flash away. When he knows the time is right, I promise you it will come to you. So the Prophet ﷺ initially with all these struggles, he grew up in community being known as the most truthful, the most honest. That was a plan of the Almighty. That plan of the Almighty was such that 
the, the one who's coming about with mercy, with tolerance, if people are to know him as the most honest and trustworthy, they would not be able to question his message because of his dignity prior to that. When some of the people were told about Muhammad, peace be upon him, saying that he was a prophet, his closest friends said, if he has not lied to us about worldly matters that happen to show immediate benefit, he will never lie to us about matters of the unseen and the hereafter. Logic. If someone really wanted to lie to you, they would lie to you about something that would give them instant gratification and instant benefit. They would lie to you about something. Imagine a person comes to you and they want to perhaps develop a relationship with you in order to abuse you. They'll tell you, I love you. I really love you. I love you so much. It's so easy to say that. People say that every day. They don't mean it. I always used to say, and I still say, we use LOL, meaning laugh out loud, on social media when we haven't even laughed. So it is very possible for someone to use I love you when they haven't even loved. Very possible. But we get fooled, mashallah. They, nowadays, they don't even have to say I love you. They show you one little emoticon and we've skipped a beat. Skipped a beat by an emoticon, subhanallah. Skipped a beat. I can't believe that. And you actually believed it. And you allowed yourself to slide into sin because of someone who knew how to abuse you. Let's go back to the point I'm raising. The point raised is when people lie, generally they would lie for some benefit of their own or to cover up something for themselves. Why would Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was known as the most trustworthy in that regard and the most honest in that regard, lie about something to do with the future? The beauty of Islam is that it calls not towards the one who's giving you the message, but to the owner of the message who is the Almighty. Yesterday we had a brother up on stage and I remember telling him here at the same venue that in Islam, the value of an individual is based on how seriously he calls you towards the Almighty, not towards himself. So if you want to know how valuable a scholar is, or you want to know how valuable a brother or a sister is, you should look at how seriously they call you towards the Almighty and the worship of the Almighty. Muhammad, peace be upon him, never ever said, worship me or come through me in order to go to the Almighty. No, he says you worship the Almighty. And you go straight to the Almighty, you pray to the Almighty, you prostrate to the Almighty. And with that, at the point where he came out with prophethood, people began to call him a liar. One of the first stories we come up with is the story of Abu Lahab. When the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in Mecca, called the people of Quraysh, his own people, upon a mount known as Mount Safa. And he tells them, oh people, if I were to tell you that there is an army behind this mountain about to come and attack you, would you actually believe? They said, obviously, we would believe immediately. We've known you as a truthful person. You've never lied to us, why would you? He says, well, I'm warning you of a severe punishment that will come in your direction if you do not quit your bad ways and habits. What were their bad ways and habits? It's important for us to know the context and to know what exactly was happening. They were engaged in every sin in the book, every sin there was to commit. They stole wealth, they treated their women so badly as objects. They bought and sold people. They actually bought and sold women. Women were treated as property. And this is why, if that is still happening today, it has nothing to do with Islam. The individuals are to blame, not the religion. Sometimes certain cultures happen to be very backward in their treatment of women. And yet, Islam is being blamed as a religion when Islam gave honor to a woman and dignity such. Do you know the rules of covering modestly in Islam are closely connected to not being judged based on your looks? So the Almighty tells you, no matter what you look like, that's from me. You could be tall, you could be short, you could be slightly fat or thin, you could be dark, you could be fair. 
people should judge you based on who you are within your service, your intellect, your character, your conduct, etc. Not superficial judgment by what you look like. And this is why many a times people might look like hot shots, but subhanallah, their character is in the opposite direction. And sometimes you have a person who might not appear to be extremely good looking according to you, but they happen to have character that surpasses the best of those whom you think are existing on the earth in terms of looks. May Allah grant us goodness in both ways. I mean, I'm sure we all want it both ways. You know, we all want it. We want to be looking good externally and internally. But don't become upset with the way the Almighty has made you. Not at all. Islam liberates you. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has asked us, instructed us, not only regarding mercy, but tolerance too and respect at the same time. You need to respect people for who they are. You need to help those whom you perhaps might not agree with, those whom you differ with, etc. You help them. You reach out to them. That is Islam. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then told these people who were engaged in every possible crime. He says, I'm giving you a warning. You need to quit these ways and habits. You need to cut out all of this. If not, then just like I said that army would come to attack and you would believe me, I'm telling you, there is something more severe than that. So here comes a man related to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of his uncles by the name of Abu Lahab. He says, Tabbalaka ya Muhammad Ali Hadha Jamatana. Woe be upon you. Destruction upon you, O Muhammad. Is this why you gathered us here? To come and give us some strange warning about an afterlife, something that's going to happen after we're dead. And they used to say, We are just living this life in order to enjoy. Who dares tell us that there is something to come after we die? The question they asked, who is going to give life to these bones after they have decomposed into the earth? Another question. This was a statement they made. It is only this life. You know, we were dead, we came alive, we're going to die. That's it. So it's just this life. Anyone who comes to tell us there is a life after death, it's unacceptable. What did he do? Did Muhammad, peace be upon him, raise his hands to Allah to say, Oh Allah, these are my people. You told me to give them a message. They have not listened to the message. Destroy them. He didn't do that. He persevered. He persisted. He continued. He bore all the negativity that came in his direction and in the direction of the earliest Muslims. And he said, we will continue to try with them. He kept praying for them. Here is a man known as Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl was such a man that he was an enemy of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and of Islam in totality because he was worried about his chair. Perhaps he might lose authority over the Quraysh. If this man was to be revered and respected because of that he decided to attack the truth he decided to harm Muhammad peace be upon him but unfortunately he could not do that the Prophet Muhammad says Allahumma a'izzal islama bi ahadil umarain look at the tolerance of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him the mercy look at what he says oh Allah there are some great enemies that we have great enemies that we have people who've been fighting us they have sworn to attack us to eradicate us to harm us oh Allah I ask you to grant strength to us by the changing of camp of either Amr ibn Hisham whose name was Abu Jahl or Omar ibn al-Khattab who was known as one of the enemies of Islam at the time so he is saying oh Allah let one of them at least accept Islam so we can have a strong man with us. I pause for a moment and bring you all the way down to 2019 today. When someone engages in a crime against the Muslims, what do we say? Has any one of us searched the heart and looked at what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did in Mecca and said, Oh Allah, yes. This man, turn him to Islam. Let him come to the deen. Imagine if he were to declare his shahada. It would be a game changer. Guess what? 
the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did it, we who claim to be his followers at times are not prepared to do this. We consider absurd a person who tells us to do this. We consider as useless one who encourages us to even look at the sunnah, to say, look at the mercy of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Are you ready? Subhanallah. You can think of anyone in your brain or your mind who has caused a lot of harm. Are you prepared to say a good prayer for them? Subhanallah. Are you prepared? We are not even prepared to say good prayers for our own mothers-in-law when we haven't even had problems with them. May Allah grant us ease. We're not even prepared to say a good prayer for our brothers and sisters from one mother and one father when we have disputed because of money. Most problems are due to finance. Forget about that finance. You're not going to get anywhere, subhanallah. You're not going to get anywhere. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. Here is the beacon of tolerance and here we are. We claim to be the followers but have we pondered over his method? Guess what? Moments later, here comes a man, Umar ibn al-Khattab, O messenger, I bear witness that you are the messenger. There is only one God and he is the only one worthy of worship. Subhanallah. Was that not a direct result of the prayer of Muhammad, peace be upon him? The supplication of the one who was sent as a mercy, the one who was actually so tolerant, I fast forward to the incident of Ta'if, which is very manifest, subhanallah, in the books of history, where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had lost his uncle, he lost his wife, Khadija binti Khawailid, radiallahu anha, he lost, for example, in fact, those were the two things that had happened that were of relevance, great relevance, and he was sad, so he decided to go to Ta'if, and in Ta'if, he thought perhaps these people might listen to the message they decided to chase him out of Ta'if, which resulted in their own negativity, not his. As they did that, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was asked by the angels of the mountains saying, you know what, these people are harming you. They have come to you. They are actually trying to destroy you. They have caused your blood to actually bleed, caused you to bleed. You give us an instruction and we will destroy them completely. He says, no, I've been sent as a mercy. Oh Allah, guide them. They don't know what they're doing. Subhanallah. What would we say? We would say, can I tell you? Oh yeah, man. Wow, you're giving me the option of two mountains come together. Come together. And you know what? I'm going to bring a few other guys also to put between. Crush them as well. That's what we would say. Am I right? Yes. Astaghfirullah. And we claim to be followers of the one who was sent as a mercy. Merciless people. Merciless people claiming to be followers of the one sent as mercy. Using his name and saying, no, he would have done this. And then we go back, subhanallah. Looking at Muhammad sallallahu life. And I cannot mention everything, but let's go to Medina where the Prophet Sallallahu showed respect for those of other faiths. As they arrived in Medina, he struck an agreement with the people of the book who lived in Medina, the Jewish people, the others who were there, the Christians, etc. He struck an agreement with them to say, look, we will actually defend each other here. If something happens, you will be with us. Wow. He did that right at the beginning in Medina Munawwara. And there was definitely justice that was laid out. You know, any country that you visit has rules and regulations. Any country. If you were to break those rules and regulations, you will be penalized. That doesn't make the country merciless. You are penalized according to the law of the country. For example, if you were to break the laws of the road, the rules of the road, if you are to break them, you will be penalized. You will have to pay a fine. You might have to serve a jail sentence. If you were to do something that's wrong, you definitely have to face the wrath of the law. That doesn't make them merciless. But what it does is it keeps the checks and balances and it ensures the prevalence of peace. When a criminal is dealt with, it is a deterrent for other criminals. 
When they look at it, they will say, oh, if I do this, it might happen to me. So they don't do it so you and I can all live safely. When a person has engaged in a crime and you let them go, what does that do? It encourages others. He got away with it. I'm sure I'll get away with it as well. And if two of them got away with it, it will encourage the whole community to become thugs. That's what happens. So Muhammad, peace be upon him, came with a set of rules and regulations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was very strict. Why was it very strict? Because more than anything else, it had to act as a deterrent. The minute you heard that this is going to be a serious matter, you would behave. The same applies anywhere on earth. Imagine if I were to tell you today that if you were to go beyond the speed limit, you're going to be paying 50,000 dirhams. What will happen? I promise if I made an example of one or two people and put them in the newspaper, for example, the rest of the country would drive five kilometers below the speed limit to make sure that we never ever clock it. Does it make anyone ruthless? No. It was a method of deterrence. We deterred the people from engaging in something that was detrimental or harmful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So those who pick on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those who pick on Islam and say that this religion is very hard, very harsh, very strict, etc. There are rules governing how you will dress, what you will drink and not drink. For example, in Islam, Islam teaches that you will not intoxicate yourself. The Almighty has blessed you with a brain. The Almighty has granted you the capacity that is unique. It raises you above all other creatures of the Almighty. Don't block it in any way. So if you were to engage or if you were to partake of intoxicants, you would actually be doing something wrong according to Islam. People say, but you know, they're not allowing me to do as I wish. Well, if you claim to be a submitter, you will understand the rules are only there for your own benefit. I remember some time back we were speaking about smoking and how bad it is. And people asked me, is it really haram? Is it really forbidden? And I said, my brother, if you were to look at any box of cigarettes being sold, internationally, there is a requirement that has to have a warning on that particular box. The box says smoking kills. It is hazardous to the health, etc., etc. If internationally they have all agreed that they are not going to sell you this box of cigarettes without writing on it, smoking kills or it is bad or hazardous, etc. And the world's non-Muslims have agreed that this is very bad for the health and there are so many places on earth where it is totally forbidden. We are still debating and arguing about it. It just goes to show we haven't even understood that Islam and its rules and regulations have actually come about in order to protect us from the very beginning, in order to give us the best health, the best of leadership abilities and skills, the best of lives, the calmness, the peace, the goodness, etc. But when we don't want to follow the rules and we want to do as we please, we pay for it. We pay for it. What that means is, yes, mankind at large is free. You are free to choose Islam or not to choose Islam. At the same time, your choice comes at a price. You, you pay for it in your own way in your own life, not that someone's going to harm you, but yourself. If a person is disciplined and they are happy and they focus on their family, their spouse, they focus on what they have and they, they stop themselves from engaging in immorality and evil, what will happen? Their children will lead a much happier life. Their spouses will be so happy. They will have a home where there is concentration and love. You know, to say, I love you, I adore you, to say all these words is good if it is dedicated to the right person or right people. The moment it is focused on the wrong person, it is to our detriment. And this is why then you have huge domestic problems because we've said words that are otherwise good, but to the wrong person. It's like sending those emojis I spoke about earlier. There is one very famous one used by a lot. I use it too. The one with a heart, it opens up big in WhatsApp. And it actually starts pumping. I'm sure you've seen that. 
I use it too. And don't say, oh, who too? You can use it in the correct way or in the wrong way. It's all up to you. It's all up to you. You can use it in the correct way or the wrong way. But you will pay a price quickly, very, very fast, if you've used it in the wrong way. Why? While you're sleeping, someone comes and check your phone. <gasps> the phone is thrown on your head while you're sleeping by who? Who did you send that message to? If people can do that so quickly when you've done the wrong thing, what do you think of the Almighty? He's actually the most merciful, so he gives you a little bit of time to say, just mend your ways. You still have a moment. Mend your ways. You still have a moment. Mend your ways. You still have a moment. Suddenly, when the moments are gone, it's only ourselves whom we have to regret. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant every one of, of us ease. I want to end by mentioning a few good qualities that we were taught from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The compassion that we should be having, the forgiveness when we learn to forgive people and we forgive each other, small matters. And I spoke about this earlier in the last few days. Small matters we actually become burdened by because we hold every little thing such that we have a mountain on our backs. Drop it by just forgiving. Let go, release. It's not a major matter. It's not something very, very big. Let it go. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has also taught us humbleness. Be humble. No matter who you are, be humble. People should learn to love one another. Allah has created us interdependent. You know, if you're arrogant, the day you need bread, the baker might chase you out and tell you, get out. Who knows? But you needed the bread. It's a simple example. The same would apply to a doctor and anybody else, the butcher or whoever it may be. If you're humble, the whole world will get along with you. And your disagreements will be made clear in a respectful way. Very respectful. When I disagree, I'm a Muslim. I follow Islam. I try to follow the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Yes, I do disagree in faith with so many people across the globe. But respectfully, we make clear what we believe and they may make clear what they believe. We will discuss matters if given the opportunity. We will propagate as best as we can. They will perhaps propagate in whatever way they would like on condition that we do it respectfully, even if it is thorough and vigorous. And even if we disagree very, very strongly, there is no need to drop that respect between us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and help us to learn from Muhammad, peace be upon him's life. He was indeed a beacon of tolerance, love and mercy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Grant us forgiveness. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad.